As we get started today, I want you to start thinking about who do you trust in terms of, I'm going to go off what Louis was saying about trust. And, you know, we so, we're, yeah, we're supposed to trust Jesus, but what about humans? What humans do we trust? Um, you know, when we think about endorsements, celebrity endorsements, you have people like Peyton Manning, who, you know, there was a time when you could not watch TV, especially during a sporting event in which there was not a commercial with Peyton Manning. Uh, when I was growing up, it was Michael Jordan. Jordan was everywhere. Uh, you know, everyone wanted to be like Mike. Um, and so we, we trust people. Uh, they have status. Uh, they've, they've been, you know, over a period of time that they've shown that they are worthy of being trustworthy. Uh, so uh, I want to share a little story. Uh, when, when my son JT was a, a senior and bigger than I am now, when he was little, he was like three years old, there was a guy, you may have heard of him, you may not have because he kind of busted, but uh, Mr. Basketball, his name was Greg Oden. All right. So Greg Oden was uh, Mr. Basketball, and he would have been the number one draft pick if he could have went into the NBA straight out of high school. Uh, I think uh, JT actually just told me a minute ago that he's the highest rated player that's come out of the state of Indiana in all of the 2000s. Anyway, so that's 21 years now. He was a great high school basketball player. And he was a great big man at 18 years old. He was like 7'1", 7'2". Um, so anyway, we lived in Greencastle. That's where the All-Stars would go and practice before their big games against Kentucky. And they had open practices. And so we went as a family and we watched them practice. And this guy came up, comes, came up. He came up. Woo! It's going to be one of those mornings. I am sorry. Anyway, so anyway, this guy comes up and he, he, you know, there's not that many of us there. And he's like, are you guys coming to the open house? What open house? He says, oh, you know, uh, it's at Almost Home, which is a really nice restaurant in Greencastle. All the food you can have? I'm like, yeah. We'll be there. So anyway, our family we go to the, we go to we oh, wow we go to the open house and we get to meet all the all stars. It was the girls team and the boys team, and uh, JT was three years old. Greg Oden seven two. JT's like this tall, and Greg Oden gets down and starts talking to JT. JT wants nothing to do with it. But what was kind of funny was. Uh, I was talking to a, a person I knew from Greencastle who was kind of involved with this, and uh, a couple of the girls, all-stars, grabbed JT. Next thing I know, my son's being passed around by all of these all-star girls, and then he's hanging out with the all-star boys because there's no one there. No one knew that this was going on. Well, JT was scared at first, but now he's warmed up, all right? And he had a book. I'm probably embarrassing the Dickens out here. He had this book called uh, Pig Plays Ball. It was his favorite book. And he had that book, and he wanted Greg Oden to sign it. But, of course, when we asked, when JT wanted nothing to do with Greg Oden. By the end of being passed around, JT had the signatures of all the All-Stars from that year. But more than that, I turned around, because I'd kind of lost, I'm a dad, I kind of lost sight of him for a minute. And uh, anyway... Greg Oden is sitting in a chair. JT is, is in front of him, and he's got Greg Oden's headphones on, and they are dancing together. <laughs> and we, the owner of Almost Home and I, we just stood there and watched. And we're like, this is a future millionaire. And look at how he is treating my son. And so on that day, we became Greg Oden fans. Because I figured if an 18-year-old boy who had all of this potential could treat my son like that, there's something inside of him that's a good, good person. And so he, was, he went to Ohio State, uh, did really well. They lost in the national championship game. Then he gets drafted first, goes to Portland. Uh, he does kind of bust. <laughs> but every time he came to Indianapolis, we went and watched him play. Or we went and watched him sit the bench because he was hurt. Uh, but we trusted him. 
And we allow JT to look up to him. And then one day, there was a news article. Uh, Greg Oden sent a picture of his no-no to his girlfriend. And when they broke up, she passed that on to the press. And see, sometimes even the people we trust the most can let us down. And so we have to be very cautious about who we listen to and who we endorse or who we allow to endorse stuff for us. LeBron this week has a powerful platform. Millions and millions of people listen to what he has to say. And he abused that power this week. He's trying to reverse it. But it's amazing how one slip can change how people look at someone or how we can allow that to, um, to influence people in the wrong way. Now, now we're going to go to Scripture. We're going to be in John, uh, the first chapter. At this moment, Jesus has no followers. He has no disciples. And uh, people, though, start endorsing him. And then people start following him. And so while we have these celebrities who endorse things, and we, we do things sometimes because the celebrity endorses them, but doesn't it also make a big difference when we know the person and we've known them for a long time and we see something's changing in their lives and they say, yeah, I've started going to church or yeah, I've met Jesus or, or yeah, I've started working out or yeah, I've changed my diet or yeah, I really like this new car. I, I, I like the features. And so we start listening to our friends because they're endorsing something that's been positive in their lives. In Scripture, we see so many times it is the endorsement, it is just the word of another ordinary human being that changes someone else's lives. And so I want you to keep that in mind as we go through these Scriptures and we start thinking about the role we can play when we simply say something as simple as, come and see for yourself. So we're going to pick up the story. Uh, we're just going to read through it kind of slowly once, and then we'll, we'll pull some application out of it at the end. So we're starting with verse 35. Uh, so uh, just to catch us up real quick, uh, John the Baptist, not John the author of the book of John, John the Baptist has, had already he'd baptized Jesus. He had, he had been testifying about him. And then it says, the next day, John was there with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus passing by and he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? Now, let's think about this for a second. John the Baptist endorsed Jesus. Two of his followers decided, we're going we're gonna to follow Jesus. We're going to follow him. Now, I actually think this is kind of funny because I, 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 I want us to play with Scripture sometimes. It's, we don't have to read it really dry. Were they like sneaking up? Were they like, where's he going? And he's like, the first words in red in the book of John is, what do you want? All right? I think that's kind of funny. In other scripture, it says, what are you seeking? And I think that it's important that we, we understand that, yeah, he's kind of saying, what are you seeking? It's a question we also need to be asking ourselves. But notice what Jesus says when they ask him a question. They say, rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said, come and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four 
in the afternoon. Imagine this. This is like MTV's Cribs, right? They got to go and see where Jesus was staying. They got to hang out, just the two of them, with Jesus for the day. Come and see. Just come and see for yourself. So we go on. It says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two that heard what John had said and who followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. See, the first thing he did was he went and told somebody else, come and see what we have found. Now, the whole thing of finding Jesus, of finding the Messiah, means that they were looking for it. They were looking for the Messiah. They were seeking the Messiah. They were anticipating the Messiah. We don't know a lot about Andrew. He's really not in Scripture very often. In fact, he's only mentioned three times. And you know what? Every time Andrew's mentioned in Scripture, you know what he's doing? He's bringing somebody to Jesus. He's not a big player in the scripture himself. But it's kind of a big deal that he's the guy who brought Peter to Jesus. So maybe you're not a big player. Maybe you're not the one. But maybe you're raising one in your home. Maybe you are the one who's going to invite the next Billy Graham to meet Jesus. See, it's not about you. It's about being faithful and obedient to taking people to meet Jesus. So Andrew endorsed Jesus. And Peter, being his brother, knowing Andrew and thinking, well, he doesn't really chase after things unless it's real, says, all right, I'll go meet this guy. And when he does, the first thing, uh, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him, Peter, and said, you are Simon, son of John, you will be called Cephas, which translated as Peter. And immediately, Jesus changed his name because he looked into his heart. We, I'll just continue. We'll come back. All right. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about the prophets who also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God descending and ascending on the Son of Man. And so Philip had found Jesus, and then he went and found Nathanael. See, we find what we are looking for. And then Philip endorsed Jesus, and Nathanael decided he would go and follow. But I think it's kind of funny. I mean, can anything good come from Nazareth? Nazareth is just a little bitty small town. Can anything good come from Kirkland? You know, we're just a small town small town thinking gives us small town results doesn't it but if we think god sized ways then we can have god sized results jesus uh, jesus saw peter under the tree even though he was nowhere near him and he's starting people are starting to think well there's something special about this guy he saw into the heart of peter and he saw into the future he saw into the past for Andrew or Nathaniel. And so what, what kind of lessons can we pull out of this um, and apply in our life? 
And I, I'm saying the words real disciples. Not fake disciples, not pretend disciples, not churchgoers. But for real disciples, when we listen to these scriptures and we apply them into our lives, the first lesson is real disciples seek Jesus. They seek him. You know, those first two disciples, they started seeking after Jesus. They, they wanted to know about him. They wanted, to, they wanted to find where he was staying. They wanted to learn about him. They were seeking after him. And we, we see, we find usually what we're seeking. I, I, I've mentioned it here more than once that I, am, uh, I, I don't covet a lot, but I do covet. Every, I mean, there, it is, and uh, my current thing is, and it has been for a while, is a, a Jeep Wrangler. I want a Jeep. I've promised Gabe, <laughs> promised my son Gabe, who's 10 now, uh, by the time he's 16, we'll have a Jeep. All right, he and I together. And uh, see, I did it for him, not for me. Um, but you know what happens when you want something? They're everywhere. I mean, we're driving down the road all the time, and Gabe and I are like, Jeep, Jeep, Jeep. It's a game. It's a game we play. Some of you, after I mentioned it, sent me pictures of your Jeeps. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, really thankful. Mm-hmm. Another lesson, real disciples follow Jesus. We don't just learn about him. We just don't think about him. We follow him. We do exactly what he says to do. These guys, I mean, you'll see it throughout Scripture. They had lives, they had jobs, they had families, and Jesus says, follow me, and they're like, all right, let's go. And you know, we say, oh, we can't do that today. Really? Why? What's changed? There is a way to follow Jesus in this culture, and it doesn't look like the culture. And that's what scares us. Real disciples, next lesson, real disciples endorse Jesus. We're willing to talk about him. We're willing to simply say to somebody who doesn't know Jesus, come and see for yourself. That's as, that's as, that's as, as easy as it gets, people. It's not on you. It's on Jesus. What is on us is just to say, come and see. Come to church. Come check us out online. Come do this Bible study with me. Come see our small group. You don't even have to be part of our church. Just come and hang out with our small group. Come and see. The last one, the last lesson, and this is the big one. Jesus transforms real disciples. See, transformation comes from Jesus. When when Peter met Jesus, Jesus gave him a new name and a new identity, and transformation began. Now, it's not a quick thing. The identity was quick. Your name's now Peter. Cephas isn't in Scripture the rest of the time. It's Simon Peter. It's Peter. His identity had changed, but we know that his behaviors didn't necessarily change. We know he still struggled with pride. We know he still, they still was part of the argument of who's the greatest. We know that he had a, a tendency to speak out of turn. We know that he, uh, he might have cut some guy's ear off. We, we know that he denied Jesus three times. But see, Jesus wasn't, when he called him his new name, he wasn't just talking about him at that moment. He was talking about his future. He was talking about, this is who I see you becoming. This is who you can be. But it starts when we start allowing Jesus to work inside our hearts.
stole my trash can from my office. And see, what happens so often is that we start cleaning ourselves up from the outside. We want to make ourselves clean. We want to clean our act up. And so, you know, so we'll say things like, well, you know what? Um, I'm no longer having sex with the wrong person. I'm no longer having premarital sex. So that's good. I'm cleaning up that. I've quit getting drunk. That's a good thing. Um, I've lost some weight on a new diet. I'm following my workout plan. I've quit lying to people. Um, I've stopped yelling at people, except my kids. I, uh, I've quit cussing. I no longer, you know, I no longer, I no longer cuss. Um, I, I've stopped spending money on stupid stuff. I stopped spending money I don't have. Stopped watching pornography. Hey, I'm all clean. It's kind of like Easter when I said we can get all dressed up and we have, I mean, we all look great. But what about all the trash inside of us? What about all the stuff we're not dealing with? What about the jealousy? What about the guilt? What about the feeling of being useless? What about all the shame that we're hiding? What about the pride and ego that's still attacking us and that we're using against people? What about that feeling of brokenness that we can't repair? What about that feeling of I'm unloved and no one will ever love me again? What about all that internal anger I have from what people have done to me or something that's happened in my past or, or how people treat me or what God has done to me? Or just that feeling of being worthless that no one will ever care? I just, I'm just junk. I'm just a trash can. And so see, if we don't deal with the stuff on the inside, if we don't let Jesus start changing us and transforming us and taking some of that stuff from us on the inside, we'll be great on the outside, but on the inside, we're still broken. We're still worthless in our hearts and our minds. That's how we view ourselves. And maybe, you know, if we just take care of the outside and we, we start replacing things like, you know what, um, I'm going to church now. I'm volunteering, you know, I'm serving and I'm doing all of these things. And, and, but you know what you're doing? You're still not dealing with the, you're just being busy. You're not really dealing with the junk. You're still carrying around all the trash. And we start, we start thinking about our performance. And we start desiring success. And we're, we're checking things off because, you know, that makes us feel good. But the inside, we're still full of trash. Or maybe we start trying to be perfect. Jesus, you know, we're, we're to be perfect. And we get into this, you know, we start getting into this legalistic mindset. And we start judging others because they're not perfect, but, you know, I'm perfect now. Or maybe our pride, we still aren't dealing with our pride and we, you know, um, we, we think we're doing stuff and we're serving Jesus and look how great we are and we're doing all this stuff and, you know, look at me, but you know what's really going on is that you want people to tell you how good you're doing. They want people to look at you and say, you're doing awesome, thank you for all the work you're doing and you're like, yeah, yeah, I am good, I'm great. And then we start feeling like we're irreplaceable See, that's a danger of pride and working on the outside. And we start pumping ourselves up. And you know what? No one else can do what I do at work. I'm irreplaceable. No one can serve the way I serve in this ministry. No one can do it the way I can do it. In fact, we start isolating ourselves. 
And, and you know what happens when we do this? We start isolating ourselves and we start doing it all ourselves and we want all the congratulations and we want it all upon us. And then when we, then we get angry at other people because they ain't doing anything, that's because you don't tell us you're doing it. And so you really want to do it for yourself because that's where you find your value and worth. And that's not how it's supposed to work. When we get ourselves and we allow ourselves to be emptied out by Jesus, then we start filling it back up with the Word. And every day we go into the Word and we let Him speak into us and we let Him say things like, you're accepted. You're adopted into my family. You're a loved child. You are forgiven. And we start cleaning the trash and getting it away from us because we realize that we are chosen because it says we are, that we are redeemed because it says we are. We are complete and we're reunited because it says we are, it says that we, that we, you, I, we are God's masterpiece. We are his handiwork. He was involved with our creation before we were ever born. He's known us before um, we were ever born. Then we can find true security. We can find true freedom. We can find true grace, true forgiveness, because it says so. And then we start realizing that we are a citizen of heaven, not earth that we're an ambassador of Christ to a culture that's in need. We are missionaries to people that we are around, and all we have to do is say, come and see. And we start understanding that we are not worthless, but we are significant. We are more powerful than we can ever imagine because he says we are. We can be a light in a dark world because Christ's light shines through us. We have value. It even says in Scripture that we are co-workers with Christ. And so we can, instead of saying we are, we are worthless, we are trash, we can say, I am a son of God. I am a daughter of the king. We can say, I, I, I'm, not just a, I'm not just a farmer or a teacher. I'm a servant of God. I'm a missionary. I'm an ambassador. And we start taking on a different value and a different mindset. But it begins when we say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you let him start transforming your life. It begins on the inside. If we do the in, we let him do the inside work, if we open that up, he changes everything. But for many of us, it just begins with a simple, come and see. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, you, uh, you've done amazing things in lives of very ordinary people. The men that we talk about here in Scripture, they were so many of them were just ordinary men. And yet we can trust their endorsement because of the lives they lived after they spent time with Jesus. So, Lord, help us to spend time with you. Help us to come and, and find you. Help us to seek after you. And then, Lord, we're going to give you all the praise. We're going to give you all the glory because of what you're doing in our personal lives, in the lives of our families, in our marriages, in this church, and in this community. Because, Lord, I think one of the biggest miracles that happens, and it happens all the time, is when you change the heart of a sinful man or woman into that of a disciple. So, Father, help us to become disciples. Help us to be on mission. Help us to change the world. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.